Hello, friends and damn givers. I'm Nick LaPara, and welcome to episode 248 of the Let's Give a Damn podcast. This is the show you listen to when you want to hear from people who are giving a damn and making our world a much better place in so many unique and meaningful ways. Thank you for hitting play. Thank you for showing up this week. And most of all, thank you for joining me and us on this journey toward leaving the planet much better than we found it. We made it, y'all. We made it to the end of another year, and we are finishing this year with 248 episodes of this podcast. We tried to make it to 250. I promise you, we tried. We really tried. But November and December were wild and hard and crazy, and I got COVID for the second time in two months. Y'all, my goodness, I got COVID for the second time in two months, so we couldn't release one that week. So here we are, episode 248. But think about that. 248 conversations with activists, nonprofit leaders, business leaders, actors, musicians, psychologists, chefs, authors, scientists, and so many other kinds of damn giving people. It's been quite the ride. And I want you to know that I hope you're not sick of me because we are truly just getting started. We have thousands of conversations left to have and to share with you, and we have so many let's give a damn projects and ideas that we are developing that you are going to have the option to participate in in the future. So I hope you're ready for that. We are just getting started. And you already know from the title of this podcast that this is a best of 2022 episode. I have nine audio clips lined up for you obviously audio that goes without saying this is a fucking podcast. I have nine clips lined up for you. Nine clips that I loved that you loved and you let me know that you loved. And I'm so excited to share them with you. But before I share more about that, I want to share something good and hopeful with you. We can all use more good and hopeful things in our lives. As you are well aware, the holidays are hard for so many, maybe for you. So actually, before I go on, if the holidays are hard for you, friend, please know that I love you, that you are loved, that we need you, that we want you, and that we, as a let's give a damn community, are hoping for better days ahead for you. I really mean that. So the holidays can be very hard for so many. For example, this past weekend was one year since my partner Rebecca's brother died by suicide. So we spent the weekend grieving and mourning and remembering Michael. For our family, the holidays will never be the same. There will never not be sadness and grief mixed in with the good times during this holiday season. And I know so many of you can relate to what I just shared. So yesterday, I'm sitting on my fire escape, smoking around 4 p.m., smoking a cigar, drinking a delicious cup of coffee, and thinking about Michael and life and shit like that. And I come across a TikTok from a beautiful human named Mike. And in this TikTok, Mike is crying because they asked their family if they would call them by their chosen name, Mike, when they go home for the holidays. And Mike tells us that they received a letter from their grandma in which she refuses to call them Mike because it's too hard and she cares too much about them and their mental health, blah, blah, blah. So I stitch that TikTok and I tell Mike that if they don't feel safe with their family this Christmas, that they are welcome to come to New York City to spend the holidays with my family and me. And as you know, with TikTok and every other social media platform, you don't know which posts are going to take off. And I've had a bunch of my TikToks go viral, but most don't. And it was a Sunday afternoon, so I assumed it wouldn't go anywhere. Well, it did see some movement in the hours after that. And I'm so glad for what happened next. Because honestly, most of my TikToks that go viral, go viral because I shit on some Trump supporter or some super right-wing conservative person, or because I'm angry over some big social issue or something like that. But this one, was a simple message of love and hope for a person who is experiencing rejection from their family, the people that are supposed to love them the most. 
since last evening and as of this recording, the TikTok has been viewed over 136,000 times. But that's not the part I want to focus on. I want to focus on the 524 comments so far. Of those 524 comments, I want to be realistic because this is social media and it's so fucking toxic. There were certainly a few horrible people that needed to let me know that I'm hurting Mike or to tell Mike to get help. One horrible person actually commented a warning to Mike that they shouldn't come here because I would end up sexually assaulting them, implying that I'm trying to bait Mike to come here for that. I share that. It's gross and stupid, and I don't want to share that, but I share it because that's the reality of putting ourselves out there and sharing messages of love. But 515 comments or so were from people all over the United States, introducing themselves, stating where they lived, and inviting Mike to come to their homes for the holiday. And I'm going to pick up my phone real quickly while I'm recording this, scroll through some of them, and read what they commented. Not all of them, but I want you to hear this because, because I feel hope. After, after this post, I feel a lot of hope that all over the place, there are really, really, really good people. So I'm going to scroll through, just read random comments that I land on. Wichita, Kansas, NYC represent. Here in Boston, we're probably going to call you Mikey Tarazi a little bit, but there's a seat at the table for Mike always. Mike is always welcome at our home in Maine. Mike is always welcome in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Got a huge bear hug waiting for them. Mike should be Mike. Happy thoughts from Seattle. If you can make it to Arizona, you're welcome to come anytime, Mike, anytime. Mike, come to South Georgia. I've got space and I'm chill as hell. Same here, central New York, but Mike is welcome. Mike, if you can't make it to New York, I live in Virginia. You are so welcome to spend Christmas with me and my son. Mike, you are more than welcome in California with our crazy bunch. Mike, I got you. LA, our home is open to you. Valencia specifically, come through. Northeast Ohio, Mike is welcome every month of the year. Big hugs. Mike, I'm in PA. Welcome to our home as well as we love you, Mike. Mike, it's so great to see you on this platform. We're in Florida supporting you, bro. Mike, welcome to be with us in North Texas. I don't know about you, and I only read, what, 15? There's 500 more that were just like that. I don't know about you, but as these comments were pouring in over the last day, I cried quite a few times, and I felt an enormous amount of hope for Mike and for our future. It reminded me that there are people in every state, every city, every town, every neighborhood that are amazing, inclusive, welcoming, progressive, open-minded, and loving people. And most of the commenters, honestly, there were some that I didn't read that kind of indicated the age of the person commenting. So many of them that I saw weren't uh, young people. They were parents, grandparents, boomers, you know, the people that uh, we assume much of the time are backward and regressive and that don't have their shit together. These are the people commenting from all states, progressive and regressive states alike, to invite Mike to be with them. And if you haven't already, go find me on TikTok, find that post, comment, share it, like it, whatever, but go follow Mike. They seem like really good people, and I know they could use your support. They need your continued support. Okay, moving on. As I stated, this is the last episode of 2022. I have chosen clips that range anywhere from three minutes to 10 minutes long from nine of my favorite and your favorite moments from this past year. In order, you're about to hear from Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis, actress and activist Rochelle Lefebvre, actor and author Tyler Merritt, therapist, researcher, author, and speaker Dr. Hillary McBride, music artist Andy Grammer, activist, author, and speaker Frederick Joseph, artist, author, and educator Alok, 
poet and theologian Padraig Otuma, and writer and speaker Anand Girdardas. A quick reminder, as always, that you can email me anytime and for any reason at hello at letsgivadam.com. You can ask questions, recommend future guests, tell me how much you love or hate the show. Anything goes. I just love hearing from you. And one more quick thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Listeners, supporters, damn givers. I hope our community grows tenfold or a hundredfold in 2023. But right now, I'm feeling a tremendous amount of gratitude for you and for what we've already been able to accomplish over these past few years. I love you all so much. And now, without further ado, let's get right into this best of 2022 episode, beginning with a clip from episode 219 with Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis. Let's go. I'm in the middle of reading, or not in the middle, I'm on the tail end of reading uh, Clint Smith's uh, latest book, How the Word Has Passed. Okay. Love Clint. Clint was, uh, uh, Clint was on my podcast way early on. And this book, How the Word Has Passed, should be required reading for every single, I, when I mean every single, I mean every person, black, white, and everybody should be reading How the Word Has Passed. What a, what a phenomenal account of where we've been, huh. how we got here, and hopefully where we're going. And, and, and in the, this, the, 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 the last third of the book, he finally gets to New York, where we are right now, New York City. They're looking at the history of this place. You know, the Dutch yeah. bought the island of Manhattan for the equivalent of $60 from the Lenape natives. Yeah. And this is where we are. This is where your church is. Yes. Started in 1628. Yes. <laughs> and what I find so fascinating is that the church that you, a black woman, are now the senior pastor of, slave owners have sat in those pews. Oh, oh yeah. Been ministers. Yeah. They've been, let's, let's go a step further. <laughs> let's, get, let's get that straight. Slave owners <laughs> yeah. have stood in that pulpit yes. to tell people yeah. who God is, yeah. what God is saying, how people should live, yeah. do this, don't do that. Slave owners. Yeah. The fuck? What the fuck is right? That's good. <laughs> I love that. So I say I'm reparations, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, no, no. You are the embodiment. Yeah. Jackie, that's yes, let's <laughs> laugh about that. But also you this is what this our day is figuring out. Because I've always said, you know, I've I've had the reparations conversation with all kinds of people over the last few years, and I'm fully in favor of all the reparations to Native Americans, to Black Americans, to everybody. Like we need to account for the shit that we've done, whether we participated in it in real time or not. But you are that is a form of reparations for you know in you know hundreds of years later, for you to be the first not only just woman but also black woman to be the minister of this church. Tell me about that experience, because that must feel, I'm sure it's hard. I'm sure there've been really, really, really hard days, weeks, months, and years. But also, what an enormous privilege to be part of this very, I mean, good and bad legacy that this church has had, right? And it's still here. It's still standing, not just the physical building, but the people that want to be part of it. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, it's Surreal, to be frank. Um, the 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 Dutch Reformed Church in America that are those are the people who bought the land from the Lenape. Um, they are the people who were able to keep their church because when the King of England came and trounced on, you know, New Amsterdam and called it called it New York, but they took it when it was Manhattan. And uh, this church is is. Is, is the beginning of the Reformed Church in America to the denomination. I came to study my church. I came to study Middle Church. I came to study how a middle-aged white man from Middle America, Michigan, Gordon Jott, with bell bottoms and curly hair, who had been a professional clown, who was white, white, not kind of white, could have a, a multiracial church. And it wasn't really multiracial, but it was white, with a significant bunch of black folks, two Chinese people and five Latinx people, who who has a multiracial church in the in America when eleven o'clock is still the most segregated hour? So I came to study him and had studied other clergy, uh, Glide Memorial folks who were doing this work, and when I studied them, 
they fell in love with me and they hired me to, to succeed him. And I fell in love with them. And I don't know how to describe what has happened over the last, I'll say 85 was Gordon. So, you know, the last 50 years of a kind of a white enclave opening the doors to people living and dying with HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. feeding programs, you know, taking care of the poor kids. And, and this is the, you know, the East Village was a tenement town in New York, poor Polish kids with no toothbrushes, um, really marrying, supporting H, uh, LGBTQIA community and becoming a Black Lives Matter, like enclave. I mean, when I first started saying Black Lives Matter after Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin, some of the people in the church said to me, like, why do you talk about race all the time? And I said, because race matters. Everything's about race. Mm -hmm. Everything is about race. And my church came along, you know, when George Zimmerman was acquitted for killing Trayvon Martin, my white classical choir bought hoodies so they could wear hoodies in solidarity with all of us doing hoodies. Like all of us, our babies took pictures with the signs, I am not dangerous. I mean, we, this church got in it. They got in it, in, in immigration, in sanctuary, in um, LGBTQ justice, anti-guns, pro-woman's choice. My church understands that our religion is not about us and God, it's about us and each other. And I'm so honored to be their leader. This next clip is from episode 222 with Rochelle Lefebvre. Teaching a child to hate another human being or to treat another human being as less than is a form of being hurt. That's that's doing an injury to a child. You know, you want to talk about child abuse, right? The the new definition. I'm talking to you, Texas. You know, the new definitions of child abuse. Yeah. Right. Teaching a child to move through the world in such a way as they are looking for who to hate, I think is a form of abuse. Yeah. You're ruining lives, your child's life for one, and all the lives they'll touch with that new, with that new weapon you just gave them. Yep. You know? During Black History Month, uh, mm -hmm. we watched Ruby Bridges. Is it called just Ruby or is it called Ruby? It's a Disney movie. Have you ever seen this? No. It's made, uh, I don't know, 20, 20, 30 years ago. And it's about Ruby Bridges. Uh, you know, this young girl that, that you know, being surrounded by police and with very much hesitation from her parents, like walked up to that school uh, because it was supposed to desegregate. And right. and I, I remember I was crying throughout the whole thing. I don't even know if it was meant to be crying moments. I just cried everything. But I'm <laughs> I, like, you know, there were parents yelling horrible things at Ruby and her parents for trying to come in and 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 mess up this school. And it, what was even more horrible, because again, there's a lot of shitty adults out there doing horrible things. The The hard part was watching, you know, the, the camera would pan down and would show the children saying the same things. Yeah. Why? Because they heard Papa and Mama say those things. It was heartbreaking. And it just was, it was a reminder. My, my kids and I, I think we talked after that movie, you know, almost as long as the movie was, just about, because they've been at, March for Our Lives rallies. Mm -hmm. They've been at Black Lives Matter rally, rallies, even at their young age. Yeah, wow. So we're we're doing the opposite of what those parents are doing. Um, but it's just so, it's so important. They're very, uh, the children are so, they're so, they're sponges and they're ready to be formed. And it's such a humbling thing to be a parent, isn't it? Knowing, oh, knowing so that humbling. we could, we could point them in the right direction and we can also fuck them up super hard by just little things that they see every day, little things they hear from us. Just very humbling. I'm always walking around on my tiptoes. I'm on eggshells, just like, yes, ultimately I don't get to decide what happens here, but I'm playing a big role in what they end up being, how they end up living, what they end up doing in the world. Are they gonna have jobs and careers and lives that impact the world? Or are they gonna be bad, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Are they gonna be fucking, you know, Bernie Sanders or a Donald Trump, right? trying into their old age to fuck up the world or make it better. Are they, you know, we can pull these examples of people that, that, um, yeah, parents, Bernie's parents and Trump's parents. Different, think, different people, I think different there was, approaches. I think there were different influences Different there. parenting approaches. I think, you know, if there's people out there who aren't parents yet, listen, for those of you listeners who aren't parents yeah. yet, but want to be, or will be one day, or are new parents, um, the, something that I've noticed, um, 
and this is connected to this whole conversation we've had about, you know, affirming your children and then also like wanting to create good people and, you know, send yep. them up, point them in the right direction. And I think, you know, one of the key words here is empathy. Yeah. And I have learned so much in the last few months about the connection between raising empathetic children and affirming who they are. Because it turns out that if you just affirm whoever your children are, if if barring barring the young sociopaths we see on SVU, sure. <laughs> you know, like um, if you if you just tell your children regularly, as I tell some version of what I tell mine, which is you're wonderful, the world is better just because you're in it. That's what I tell my children. That's yeah. their good. That's their kiss good night. They're they're literally bored of me. Guess what? I'm wonderful. The world is better just because I'm in it. Yes, you're wonderful. The world is better just because you're in it. Just by being born. You don't have to earn your spot. You don't have to be anybody specific. You just, whoever you are. And then as they grow, whoever they tell me they are, both my children, whoever they tell me they are, the answer is yes. Yeah, I'm going to yes, believe, believe you. Yes, wonderful. I'm going to believe you. Yes, wonderful. And it turns out, guess what I have witnessed that that does at the park when they interact with other children at school or they, you know, are out in the world in any situation. Guess what? Turns out, how do they treat other people? Other kids tell them who they are. Okay, great. And I just think about like, what will that look like? If we raised our children that way in ma en masse, what will that look like years from now, decades from now? Again, I get like sort of dramatic, but I don't apologize for it. I actually think, you know, these are the ripples that change the world. I get sort of Marianne Williamson big eyed on yeah. the debate stage yeah. about it, you know, or yep. become sort of the family yep. hippie, the family kook where I go, no, no, listen, you tell children, yes, whoever you are is wonderful. Yes. Okay. That's who you are. And then that's how they treat everybody else. And then maybe decades now we're not living through a horrible war, multiple wars that are, you know, I don't, a war makes it sound like there aren't other wars no, in other but places. but I get it. Right. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yep. I do. Yeah, I do. And I'm, I'm so glad you're parenting in the world. And I'm so glad I'm trying to parent in the world because I do think you're, you're so right. One of the beautiful things about life is that our legacies will outlive us and we won't get to see the fruits of our labor. So we'll hopefully get to see our children grow up. If they find partners, start families, whatever it is, we'll get to see that. But then we won't get to see maybe after that or a little bit of it when right. they're young and then we pass on. And I think that's beautiful because it, it humbles me. Mm -hmm. If I get to stay around for the next 300 years and see multiple generations of m the effect that I have, I'm going to, if I'm doing things, something right now, I will get a big head. And it's just not natural to like see that much of the extent of our nope. legacy. We're going to die. Yep. And they're going to keep living. And that humbles me so much as I'm living every day, making decisions, you know, kissing my kids, hugging my kids, yelling at them, and then getting down on my knees to ask for forgiveness because I shouldn't have done that. We won't get to see the ripple. We won't get to see too far down the line. And that's a good thing. It, it should keep us humble. It should keep us in the moment and doing the best that we can because we won't get to see if we fuck it up down the line. So it's, there's just more of a reason for us to get it right, slow down, be patient. This next clip is from episode 225 with Tyler Merritt. Here we are. Let's start present day and work our way back. It is March 30. We're recording this March 30, 2022. Little over 24 hours ago, after 200 attempts in Congress over the past 120 years, we have finally passed an anti-lynching bill, a comprehensive anti-lynching bill, the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill. What? Like, I don't mean to start here, but like, let's start here because we could bring up so many examples that you talk about in the book that we all know about that are things that we've seen in real time on social media. But like how in the year of our Lord, 2022, after 200 attempts in Congress. How are we just signing this? Where are we at right now, Tyler? What is your view on what we're experiencing right now? We've seen a lot of, we've seen as a million pundits and journalists and reporters have called it, you know, a race, a race reckoning over the last five, six years, whatever that means. That means a lot of things, but like, here we are, even five, six years ago, this should have been passed, let alone 120 years ago. 
where are we right now? What are you thinking? What are you kind of working through right now? So let me say this. We could have a whole podcast based on just this conversation and, and just this. I'm going to make this conversation probably one of our shortest topics that we talk about the whole time. You ready? Yeah. Why, and wh- why are we here and what's going on? Let me first tell you, let me tell you who is not surprised by the fact that this has just been passed. Mm. Black people. Mm-hmm. And the reason that we are here still is because of white people. Now, if you don't, I have nothing against white people. Mm-hmm. Google who my girlfriend is. <laughs> okay. Um, nothing against white people. But simply put, black people are not surprised that this just passed. Yeah. And it is because white people have kept it from passing. Like every other ridiculous, asinine thing that has to do with any sort of black movement f- forward for black people. It's white people who, who are f- uh, scared to death that forward progression of anyone outside of themselves means the end of who they are. When you control the laws, when you control the bills, when you control the, when you redline, when you have this kind of control, which is all based in fear of losing what you think is yours, you end up in 2022 finally saying lynching is not okay. So eh, we can complicate it. Like we can, we can elongate it and talk about it a million ways. But the simple act is, is that, and like I said, not all black people are monolithic, but black people are not sitting around right now going, oh my God, this is cra- This is insane, Nick. Now we're going, yeah, that's, that, that's on brand. <laughs> like that sounds, that sounds about right. That's, that sounds about right. And sadly, um, it's white people's fault, man. Yeah. Hey. I don't know what else to say. No, that's that's <laughs> that's fine. That's more than fine because that is the reason. And any and I think I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that 99 percent of the white people listening right now, if they've been on board with "Let's Give a Damn" and what's going on in the world, and they've hung on for more than a few episodes, and they kind of know who I am and the kinds of conversations we have, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that no one that is white. And just listen to this pod, listen to that five minute thing that you just shared is surprised or offended by that because it's true. And many things can be true at the same time in the same way that you and I can identify as Christians still in light of the fact that Christians are some of the worst people that I've ever met in my life means that more than one thing can be true at the same time. It means that nuance is incredibly important. It means that living in the gray is incredibly important. Mm. It means that it means that you as a black man in America, along with the other tens of millions of black Americans can not be surprised at what just happened. And that makes me, A, that makes me so much more like, uh, I admire you all so much more. (laughs) And also, I want to punch a fucking wall. Like, I want to just go, I I saw Reverend Barber, God bless him, you know, was at the signing yesterday. And I love that all that Reverend Barber does with the Poor People's Campaign, such a great advocate and activist and wonderful human. And I'm sitting there thinking, how, how how do you sit here and uh, rejoice and like not just stand up and pull out your hair and say, how are we just doing? Because that? that's I I have a very like I'm I'm as I get older I am controlling my impulses more, <laughs> but I could be I mean unchecked and without the right people in my life. I'd be a horribly just like loud and abrasive person that just never shuts up and is always thinks he's doing the right thing by calling out all the injustices and all the bad things happening in the world. But it just, it it's wild to me that Reverend Barber just sits there and claps his hands after it's, it's signed and says, we've got work to do. 
you know, and has a few minutes with VP Kamala Harris and like says, I, I'm, I'm believing that better things are ahead. And I'm just like, oh my God, like not, oh my God, in a bad way, just, oh my God, in a, how are you doing this? How do you yeah. do this day in and day out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let, let me speak to that on two levels. I can't speak for Reverend Barber, but how, how dope is that dude? Like incredible. Really. Um, but, but let me, let me speak to two things as a black man in America. I do not have the privilege to not have hope. Mm. I, I just don't have the privilege to not hope that the, that, that tomorrow is going to be a better day. Therefore, when we, when I experience things that seem like they're ridiculous, asinine, stupid, crazy, all of those things, I look at them. And, and it's not that I don't have my moment, but I go, okay, here's hope for tomorrow. We've had, a, we've had something today. Now here's on to hope, continued hope for tomorrow. Um, with that um, comes this thing that I didn't talk about in, my, in this book, and I might talk about in the next one that I write. But I use this analogy, and if people have listened to podcasts for me, I know I've said it at least once on a couple of podcasts. Um, this is how I feel about probably how Reverend... Barber Phil, and, and a handful of people, how I feel most of the time, man. I, as a black man in America, feel like I live on my Bruce Banner shit. And this is what I mean by that. As a black man in America, I, I, I love in the Marvel movies where um, there's this moment with uh, where somebody says, hey, we need the green guy. We need the green guy now. You know? And um, I forget which Marvel movie it was. So we need the green guy now. And uh, Bruce says, he says, he turns around and he goes, see, that's the secret. I'm always angry. And he immediately turns, right? And he's like, I got this under control, right? That's how I feel as a black man in America. I am constantly incredible Hulk. Like I am, I stay angry. Like I stay angry, right? But to be effective in a world that I have to try to find hope yep. in every day, I live on my Bruce Banner shit. You follow me? I do follow but you. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. My secret is, is that I stay angry. <laughs> so what you may see that comes out in, you know, 18 chapters of a funny book, joking from everything from Gwyneth Paltrow and vaginal steaming to, you know, Hootie and the Blowfish, you know, or the cranberries, you know, you is is also a man that wakes up every day, walks outside of his you know, outside of his door as a six foot two black man in America and has to go, well, what kind of shit am I gonna have to deal with today? This next clip is from episode 227 with Hillary McBride. The wisdom of your body, finding mm. healing, wholeness, and connection through embodied living. I want to, I'm gonna pick a few chapter titles and just ask you to sort of, I don't want to give people too much. Everyone needs to buy this book and keep it oh, on their nightstand and read mm -hmm. and reread. Um, it, it will, it will help everybody I know needs this book and it will help them. Wow. Uh, it, wow. It, it, but we don't have time to go through the whole thing, but before, before I pick and choose a few chapters and say, Hey, Hillary, can you just like tell us a little bit about this chapter? Because we don't have a ton of time. Why, why did you, it probably makes sense when people know who you are and the kinds of work mm. that you do. I mean, in, in your bio uh, that, that I saw online, it says, I love to help. I love to see people grow, heal, change, and come into more fullness in themselves and their relationships. And also in your bio, this I thought was interesting because this tells me a little bit about who you are, not just as a, not just as a professional, you know, PhD masters, masters and PhD level therapist, but also just as a person in your, it says, I enjoy working with adults with various issues, including anxiety, depression, self-esteem, body image, life transition, mother, daughter relationships. And you keep going on and on, but you specialize <laughs> in areas of trauma, eating disorders, body <laughs> image, marriage, and like you, your whole, like every single day, right before we got on this podcast, you finished up a few minutes late with a client, right? So you're talking about these things. Why did you write this book and why are you, give mm. us a kind of a high level, uh, a, a, a synopsis of what makes you want to work with all of people's shit. Like this is yeah. hard stuff <laughs> and every day, the things uh, I just mentioned, like uh -huh. they're, they're, they're on you and then you're helping them. Mm. But why? Okay. 
Why write this book? Why write the book? Why do the work? Um, one, I think it's important to say that I, I think there's like, re- we say this in the academic community, research is me search. There's like so much of my own stuff that's wrapped up in why I want to help other people. Like I've had some really shitty therapists who I felt like they did more damage. And there's probably some like ego thing in me that's like, I can do it better. <laughs> I'm going to do it better. I'm not going to hurt people the way I was hurt. But I think that there's something about like all of this being like confounding to me too. Like, what does it mean to be human? What do we do with the fact that we're in bodies and the bodies that we're in are the places where we hurt each other and where we feel our pain and where we carry our trauma and where we, you know, experience hierarchy and oppression. What do we do with the fact that we're in bodies and our bodies die? Like, how do we wrap our mind around the complexity of this experience of being human when it also holds this other side, like our bodies are where we experience pleasure and joy and vitality. And how are we, how are we grappling with all of this? It's like, I'm struggling with those questions too. And I hear people all the time dealing with the after effects of not knowing how to be with the complexity of being human and how all of the ways that we try to get away from it and the way we numb and avoid and somehow try to protect ourselves from the pain mostly because we probably think the pain is too big and overwhelming and we're never going to get through it. And yet when we have someone who says me too, or I want to be in it with you, or I get it, all of a sudden it becomes a little less overwhelming and a little more manageable. And we find the capacity to, to stretch and hold it. And, and then it doesn't overwhelm us. And then we see that there's beauty in it too. And there's something about this, like, um, I'm just thinking about composting. My friend Robin, Robin used this language, composting our pain, that Mm. taking painful things and being together with them allows something beautiful to grow. And I've seen that in my own life. And when I zero in on the embodiment piece specifically, I think about how much I've hated my body, how the body was the place that held all of the pain and all of the trauma. And so it felt easier at some point to fragment off my existence and just be dissociative, just just make, make my body disappear, make it go away, try everything I could to hurt it and suppress it and subdue it. And I think for a long time, I saw myself as different from other people in doing that. But the more I started researching just embodiment and this fragmentation, I saw that that's a, that that's a coping mechanism that our culture hands us to say, get away from your body create a hierarchy, be in your mind, dissociate and, and shame other people who, who aren't in there or who can't do that and who are in their bodies and mm. feel like you're better than them and, and kind of get climb into the mind palace to get away from the pain of existence. And I found comfort in realizing when I'm not alone in struggling with being in the body and I'm not alone in thinking that the body is the problem because one, that's where pain is, but two, our culture has told us that that's the best way to be. So I see myself as part of this cultural fabric of people who are suffering with the lived realities of what it means to be fragmented from ourselves and each other. And I've just seen time and again and again and again what happens when we do it a different way. This next clip is from episode 228 with Andy Grammer. There's a couple issues that I usually will speak up about. Race is one of them. Mm, yes. Where I really feel like it's really important for me to speak up about that. Uh, there's a couple others. In general, um, I just don't know how effective it is on on uh, social media. Yeah. I don't know if that's like the place where we're going to like change somebody's mind. <laughs> Like, is like real good discourse occurring there? I think for me, it's a lot more about like in my inner circle, if someone says something that feels off to me, it's a it's a pull you aside and let's have a conversation and try to get all the way yeah. into it. Um, also, one of the things that's been lucky about being a musician is you're, you're just getting to travel and be around different people every day. So I have deep friendships with many people that are, identify as red, blue, whatever. The other thing is that in, as a Baha'i, mm-hmm. you're not allowed to um, identify with a political party. Mm. So you're like, I'm not allowed to, because you, you, inherently it's divisive. Politics inherently, a two-party system is divisive. Yep. So you're not allowed to like get in, be seen that way or contact, like really 
comment too much on things that would lend you to be right or left. Now that's delicate and that's scary. Yep. You also don't want to be just someone who doesn't care. Like I care deeply about yep. many things, but um, yeah, I don't know that my voice is as necessary. And when it really feels like it needs to be, then I like, I'll, I'll jump in and say some stuff. Yeah. But in general, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty divisive. No, a few different points. I sometimes make force myself to believe that my little voice is more effective than it actually is on social media. Yeah. Right. Like we need to, this is because we're so digital now and everybody lives on the internet. Of course, this is where we have to have the dialogue, but that's bullshit. I know that. I, I assume most people know that as well. Even those that contribute to it. Sure. I mean, if you just spend 10 minutes on Twitter, there are 9 million, you know, opinions uh, about 9 million different things. And they're all, everybody says they're right. That can't possibly be true. Yeah. How do you wade through that? I was, I was in a, uh, a little back and forth with a friend of mine the other day about, he is, um, a very loving, uh, pro-lifer that isn't like, you know, isn't like the far right sort of pro-lifer, right? So he's a very reasonable one, but still pro-life, not my position at all. But so we're having this back and forth about this whole thing. And it just got like three tweets back and forth. It got like heated. Like it shouldn't fast. have gotten heated yeah, yeah, yeah. really fast. You want to know why? Because you're, you're, you tweet something, you have no idea if they're responding to it, if they're just waiting it out. So then you have another thought and you go and tweet it, but they're, on the, they're, they're tweeting something back and they just get lost in the mix. And then I just recently changed my phone number. So he was tweeting my, he was texting me saying, dude, let's just get on the phone. But then my other tweet came in. Got it. And he was like, what, what the fuck? Like, why isn't he stopping this? Like he really wants to, that is how most of them end up. Yeah. And so I'm glad you went there, which is like, is, what is this even doing? Because I'm constantly pushing myself to like, I don't want to be, yeah, to share more, again, not just positivity for positivity's sake. Yeah. But like share more good news, share more good things. And I think that's why you have been so effective in music and um, and otherwise is because there are a lack of voices like yours. Yeah. There are a lack of people that, again, I, I in no way am saying you don't speak up about the things you care about. No, I've seen no. You. And I think that it's just a very but delicate. But compared to other people that like, yeah, you know. It's a very delicate line. Yeah. And you got to kind of case by case, see what feels right. Yeah. And, and when, when is your moment that you can not just add to the noise? When is your moment where being silent is, um, now, now you're like, you're, you're taking a real stance by being silent. Yeah. You know, and figuring out how to, how to do that dance is interesting. Well, yeah. And we have by and large as a society have said, especially people on my side of the aisle, more progressive, you know, folks have kind of determined that if you don't, if we don't see like, whether it's, whether it's George Floyd's murder, uh, Roe v. Wh whatever it is, uh, the insurrection, like if you don't in 10 minutes, if you don't have a tweet up, yeah, an Instagram up about it, stating, like telling us where you stand on this, you must not care about it. Totally. And I think there's a lot of, you know, even, even hearkening back to what we were talking about before, um, there's a lot of work to be done around these things. So sometimes it's easier to just put up a, a post and then not like do work yes. around, around the thing. Yep. And so sometimes it's also scary if you feel like you haven't done the work when a major event happens to be like, am I the one that's supposed to be commenting on this? Or is it time for me to like go learn about this? So good. <laughs> you know what I mean, yeah. like, I don't know if I should, like it's, I can definitely hop on a bandwagon, yep. but I think I need to go do some work in my community and understand or have a conversation with someone who's having an issue with this. I am not advocating for being silent. That no. That is not it. But just No, but very, that yeah. is wise. And it, you want to know why we don't do that generally as a society? Because it's hard work. It's hard work. It's man. easy to tweet 240 characters. Yeah. It's really hard to say, I'm going to go read uh, Cast by Elizabeth Wilkerson, or I'm going to go read these books. I'm or go, go have conversations. Or go have the conversation. Like, but, real that's, conversations. but that's hard, yeah. right? Because we have to get, you know, this buddy that, that I'm talking about. Like, we have a phone call tomorrow. I blocked off an hour. Yeah, and great. it's going to be, you know what it's going to be? It's going to be amazing. It's going to be super chill. Yep. There will be no tension. I will share my thoughts. He will share his. We'll go back and forth. Yep. And it will end probably with respectful disagreement on a certain number of things and yep. also a virtual hug across the phone. Like, exactly. yo, I love you. I'm for you. I think we want the same things ultimately. We're just, you know, that whole sort yep. of thing. Where on Twitter, it took 12 and a half seconds for it to get fucking like crazy. Yep. And so that is the hard work, but it's the necessary work of like, stop typing, stop posting the, you know, the screenshots and the photos and actually 
do the hard work, which yeah, is- Yeah, and I think for, you know, we're two white guys, right? Yeah. I think that we just have a lot of context that we're off on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So in general, my new place is when something happens, I go like, I need to go check my context. I need I to go it. run this by a lot of people that uh, are not coming from my very limited understanding of how the world is. This next clip is from episode 232 with Frederick Joseph. In the midst of both millions of Americans uh, opposing uh, these amazing humans' right to even exist, right? So that's happening. And then you have all this gratuitous, just lavish but uh, uh, fake marketing ploys happening, right? You have all this stuff going on. How can we... truly help, truly make a difference, knowing that all those realities are taking place, knowing that trans kids will feel enormous amounts of pressure this month, uh, again, from both sides, from all the voices and all the things that they're receiving. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, do we, how do we do this better? Yeah, I, I'd say take actions that are actually going to create systemic change right and and there's so there's so many things that you can do like you know i, I love pride i like like you said I, I i love the energy especially in new york city i love oh, it's so amazing yeah I, I love the energy of pride um but it's, it's very similar to you know black history month right where it's like sure you can you know invite you know invite me in to come to, you know talk to your staff during black history month and then i'll hear from you next february right um as if there aren't things happening all year as if you know like during pride there aren't you know the, the don't say gay um policies in florida two months before three months before as if ron DeSantis isn't going to potentially run for president you know all these different things that that are happening take real action Right. Like take action that can actually create change. Like using like Bill Maher's example, like just when he said that, I would have loved to see a, a bunch of people. Like I'm sure people like, you know, did the Twitter thing and whatnot. Sure. Um, but but I the guests on the show. Jesus. Right. Should have. Should have interrupted, right? It, right. Somebody right. Should have right. That's, like, that's what the exactly fuck, dude? right. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. I, again, I haven't seen it, but it's like, no. Right. Like and he's on what? HBO. Yeah. Yeah. It's like like HBO also has. um Multiple like shows that are like focused on uh, the LGBTQ um, IA plus community, like right, like it's like wait, what? Yeah, right. Like some someone needs to actually speak up and like hold them accountable, right? I would love to see a petition against HBC, HBO, HBO, and against Bill Maher, right? If that's the case, right? Um, I would love to see a collective of people who are essentially cishet people who I, I constantly say we need to step up. Right. Like it's not enough for us to be like, oh, I'm really support you. Like, yay, wave my flag. And you know, no. Like, I want to actually see people held accountable. Right. Like, I like, you know, even like outside of this conversation, you know, what what happened with um, you know, uh uh in Texas when when Beto O'Rourke went to um Greg Abbott and Ted Cruz's conference. It was like, this is your fault, right? That's the energy. Like yeah. that's what I'm talking about. This is your fault. Yeah. Right. And I'm going to say it publicly and I'm going to say it loudly and it's not performative because I've seen him do it other times too. Right. This is your fault. So now my question to people in Texas and around the country is what are you doing to support Beto against Greg Greg Abbott? Yeah. Right. And things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the I can I can sum up everything you just said and actually take action, like right. real action. Right. Buy your fucking flag. I don't care. Buy your flag. Hang it up in the window. Buy your T-shirt. Change your your profile picture. Those are all fine and well. Right. But if that's all you do and you're not giving to the Trevor Project or you are not uh, befriending your trans neighbor that needs friends and really being a support system for them, and you're not you know and you're not showing up to vote for. Uh, uh, progressive candidates that yep. you know are going to make the right decisions, yep. then shut up. Is it, that's exactly Stop it. Stop with the performance. That's exactly it. And, and I think that we saw so much of it um, around, you know, the 2020 protests, right? Like, you know, I was protesting just down the block from here um, many times and being 
pepper sprayed by police and you had these, you know, a lot of people coming out and doing photo shoots to say that they were there and things of that nature. And, and it's like either really do something or get out the fucking way. This next clip is from episode 233 with Alok. What if this wasn't about intelligence and what if it was about trauma, right? It's obvious to you and me, but what if we were to do an, an exercise to say, how come it's not obvious to so many people? And to really seriously take that question. What leftists often say is it's because they're ignorant. And I, I think that's that's a cop out. It's, it's not working. It's never worked. It's not working for sure. Um, I think it's actually about trauma. It is easier to demonize trans and non-binary people than it is to sit with the heartbreak of knowing that when you were a young person and you experienced a kind of freedom and fluidity and then the people who loved you told you, no, shut up, you have to be a boy or a girl and this is what it means to be a boy and this is what it means to be a girl. And they police you into that so deeply that you become the police and you defend it that's what an abusive culture does, is it recruits you into its own image. And so once again, what if we were to see all of this incendiary rhetoric as an elaborate cry for help? These people don't know love. And I feel deeply sad for them that they're more upset about the existence of gender diversity than the existence of climate change. I feel deeply sad that manufactured make-believe issues because we don't have make-believe genders. They have make-believe issues. It's true. That these make-believe issues take so much of their energy and time when that energy and time could actually be going towards, I don't know, maintaining a garden, like eating really nutritious food, hanging out with your friends. I mean, you mean to tell me that you're going to spend precious moments of your mortal existence on life hating other people? That says so much more about you than it does about the people that you're hating. You don't feel like your day is worth levity. You feel like you're overcompensating for something and like you have something to prove. So how do we, and I totally agree with you, and I love that you brought me back a bit because I, I agree with you. I get fired up, but I, I agree with you. And I agree with you because those people that retweeted it in the affirmative, saying, yeah, they're creating them, and, and it's, it, this is not a real thing. Th those are my people. Those are the people I grew up with. I didn't grow up around progressive professors mm -hmm. or educated people. I love my parents. Neither of them have a college degree. Um, they just worked hard, blue-collar jobs. My dad is an immigrant. And... So I totally agree. And I agree because I've seen in the, in the times when I can stop, you know, not even, not even saying it, but just stop acting like they're ignorant, like they're stupid, like they're foolish, and actually come into a conversation looking to help, I actually do see progress, right? It might be an inch, might be a couple inches in a conversation. But there's actual progress versus the reality that by screaming across the aisle, telling them how fucking stupid they are for believing, for even asking a question like that, that gets us nowhere, like absolutely nowhere. And in fact, I think that they, they're they baiting us. They want us to meet us at that frequency so that then they can caricaturize us and belittle us and then win more money and votes. I, I refuse that called because I'm not interested in even engaging in people who are operating at a lower frequency on their frequency. Mm. I'm going to live my life with love. And so, yes, of course, I'm going to have conversations across the aisle. And of course, I'm going to have uh, debates with people who disagree with me. But if that requires me to have to indulge something that basic, mm, I want us to have the real conversation. The real conversation is most people don't know what love is. Most people have not been loved. Most people actually have been told that they have to disappear themselves. That's the conversation I want to I want to the conversation mm -hmm. about how we exist in a country that still, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, still sees mental health as not physical health. 
one of their primary talking points in the right wing right now is facts over feelings. They're indisputable biological facts. And your feelings, I hate to break it to you, but feelings come from the nervous system. Yeah, exactly. And the nervous system is part of the body, which means it's biological. So your dismissal of feelings actually is anti-biology. And in fact, we have all of the data and the science to show that feelings can lead to death <laughs> because actually emotions can sublimate into illness. The mind-body split, like the male-female and boy-girl and man-woman split, is false. So the larger issues we need to address is not responding to every single individual tempting us, but how do we build a mass movement for mental health infrastructure in this country where people have free, comprehensive, trauma-informed therapy? That's what I'm interested in doing. I want all of these people to be in therapy that actually where they can process what it meant to love people who tried their best to destroy them and call it love. I want all these people to be able to experience an iota of the love that I experienced from my aunt. I want all these people to be able to to, to heal their inner wounded child because that's what all this is about. And it's, it's just it's shocking to me because this conversation should be the conversation. We have all of the data now to show how earlyhood childhood exposure to trauma shapes your entire life's outcomes. Right, right. And yet we still talk about these people as if they are just, quote, sociopaths or just bad people. And every time I see someone who people call bad, I'm like, I wonder what their childhood was like. Yeah. And that's what that shouldn't be seen as me being a compassionate person. That should be seen as me being uh, an honest person. We have all the data now to show how family systems and dynamics can either make or break people. And that p people like you actually should be the people we're listening to of how do you how do you, when you grow up in those environments that teach you to restrict yourself, how do you get free when at a cellular and fundamental level, you're taught that your very freedom is a threat? Those are the stories that we need to uplift because they teach us that transformation is possible. This next clip is from episode 236 with Padraig Otuma. When we speak in Ireland about Catholic and Protestant, we're not really speaking at all about theological things that do people believe one thing about Mary or another thing about the Eucharist. We really are speaking about, about cultural belonging and whether or not the north of Ireland is or should be British or Irish. And so that's a really important thing to understand about what it means to speak about sectarian experiences of conflict in the north of Ireland. It really is about the ongoing legacy of hundreds of years of British presence and the ongoing question as to how it is that identities of Britishness and identities of Irishness coexist in a place like the six counties of the north of Ireland. And so 1921 partition happened and then by 1965 it was really clear that violence was going to er erupt. There was terrible conditions for working class people, British and Irish, um, but there was particular conditions under which Catholic Irish people were being put under. So there was a civil rights movement and that civil rights movement was um, commodified by people who wished to say the only way to bring our cause to the attention of Britain is by a violent campaign. And then from 1968 to 1998, there was a violent campaign called, most latterly, the most recent version of The Troubles. And Corimila and many other groups um, seek and sought to find a way to bear witness to something that might save us in the middle of weekly murders, daily murders, daily tensions, um, fortified borders, um, exacerbated political polarization, threats, um, gerrymandering, um, the, the lack of the, a huge democratic deficit in terms of the way that decisions were being made. Um, it, it, looking at how young people were being socialized separately. So kind of Catholic young people and Protestant young people tended to go to separate schools. And so looking at the impact of that and it isn't just because they hate each other that they're going to separate schools. It's also that sports that one community would like were being taught in one school and not in the other. And it was also about cultural markers. People should be able to go to the schools they want. I'm all for school choice. 
so when it comes to the question of Ireland. And so Carmilla is a community that is seeking to work with young people, seeking to work with adult groups, faith groups, community groups, victims groups, perpetrators groups, also other groups that seem to be less inside the question about politics. So from 1980, Corrie took a vote in terms of the membership and was fully inclusive of lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans people, which is quite extraordinary because homosexuality wow. had not yeah. been decriminalized in either of the Irish jurisdictions in 1980. Um, similarly, also when it came to um, people who were seeking asylum and people with learning disabilities, Corey Miller was really interested from uh, for a long, long time about what it is that these experiences of being alive speak about the broader question about human belonging. Um, so Corey Miller these days has about um, 30 staff and works, I think, with about 8,000 people a year on various programs, maybe even more, including online stuff. Um, various programs that look at what does it mean to bear witness to a hope and a vision for peace. Um, some of those are faith-based, but not a huge amount. A huge amount of them are based on, you know, working alongside local community leaders, working alongside people who are um, recruiting young people into violence, working alongside people who are looking at what community cohesion looks like, as well as doing ongoing assessment and intervention into trauma. Um, so I've been involved with Carmela kind of most of the time since I moved to Belfast in 2003. And I, I think it's really important to say that, you know, for me, these last 20 years of being involved in the particular manifestation of conflict, British-Irish conflict, as you see happening in the north of Ireland, I, I think that does not mean that I have anything wise <laughs> or a template to say when it comes to conflicts elsewhere. One of the things about conflict is that it... Um, it occurs in its own way in different places. And where in the context of Ireland, I certainly have things to say. I am usually wanting to hear and learn and listen when it comes to thinking about what the what the lessons of that should be for elsewhere. I, I can make a few, I can make a few goals to say here's something that we have found helpful, but I don't in any way think that the the map of our compromises, the map of our attempts to to reduce the amount of deaths on a weekly basis in terms of British Irish peace, I don't think that that necessarily provides a map for elsewhere because some of the things you have to do in the compromises of getting towards a sustainable peace with the benefit of hindsight do not seem to be hugely adequate. I've heard you talk about Cormila and the conflicts that have happened and are still happening and the the amazing work that has happened there. In the, I've heard you talk about it in the past. Um, but I've even learned, you know, more this time that you shared it around. And, and, and while I don't think, while I don't think uh, what you all and Cormila has been doing is like a one for one with what's happening here in the U.S. No, I do. I do think that there are so many things to learn. From sure. like because even as you were talking about daily deaths and and all these things that that hap, have happened and are happening. There is a tremendous amount of uh, similarities just on a bigger scale what's happening here in the U.S., what has been, ha what's been happening since our inception, since our very horrific bloody birth uh, up, up to this day. Yeah. I mean, well, w one thing to say in that is that for me, like when it comes to telling the story about Carmela, it's why for me I want to start in 1801 with the Act of Union of so-called Act of Union of Britain and Ireland. Um, and the, I mean, some people would say to me, dear God, probably like, why aren't you starting back in 1604, you know, because to, to understand where we're at today, it is important to have some broad brushstrokes about how to be able to narrate the, the major decisions that continue to affect people in the here and now. And one of the complications is that like when I go across to Britain and you say regularly to people in Britain, um, what, why is it that we have British Irish conflict in the north of Ireland? Regularly, people are unsure as to why I'm calling it British-Irish conflict. They'll go, no, it's just Irish conflict. You're like, no, you don't know your own history. Wow. And so there is a complicated thing, and I'm going to speak about empire here, and I mean empire both formally and informally. There's a complicated thing where empire usually has the luxury of reflecting on its own glory days without actually knowing them. And I do see that one of the tasks of integrity of a society that's calling itself peaceful is to manifest in itself the, the dedication formally 
of learning its own bloody past and the impact of its own bloody past on the people whose cultures, languages, lives were decimated and annihilated and enslaved in the case of the United States. And so I find it um, disheartening that the British um, that the British history curriculum does not include the history of empire because I, I don't understand how British people can understand their place in the world if they do not understand what the last 300 years of the world have been like. Why the hell do so many places speak English, for instance? What, you know, what is this thing, the so-called commonwealth or stolen wealth, as the hashtag was going most recently um, during the Commonwealth Games? How do we understand those things in the past? Because they are manifesting themselves in the present today. And when there is resistance to that, resistance to knowing the past by saying, oh, you know, you're just demeaning us all in the here and now. I find that to be um, not good enough. There's a lot of Irish history that is shameful for me to pay attention to when you look at how Irish people... Um, left Ireland having lots of, you know, during the famine, having been, the, the, you know, we don't even call it a famine, we call it the great hunger because it was a decision. You know, the potato blight was one thing, but there was plenty of food to pe feed people. So lots of people who were being starved through systemic choices left Ireland and then went to the United States and were interested in fighting against the emancipation of enslaved people. And we're seeing that, well, if emancipation happens, well, then therefore, where will our place be? Mm. That is a story of Ireland that Ireland needs to know. We like to think that we're the friends of the world and everybody likes us because we're funny and have nice music or whatever, drink Guinness. But there is a history of Ireland that we need to pay attention to. And much and all as I am an absolute critic of the, the arrogance and war making of empire, I also am an absolute critic of the decision in the 1960s by some people to say they they chose to say civil rights marches and civil rights demonstrations and and um, protests and inter interruptions and interventions will not be good enough. We need to launch a violent campaign against Britishness in Ireland. And they were wrong and they murdered and tortured people over 30 years. And in the context of me paying attention to the Ireland that I want to be a part of and the, the future of Ireland that I want to be a part of, it's very important for me to, to wear the shame of that on me, not in the sense that I am responsible for it. I wasn't alive in the 60s, but in the sense of that I need to know it and I need to not be undone by telling the truth of it. And finally, last but not least, this clip is from episode 243 with Anand Girdardas. Let's talk about our, how do I say this? Our inability to let people evolve and believe that they can, right? Because that's a huge part of this persuasion. And let's talk about along with that. So we on the left, me, me on the left, it's really hard for me to accept that someone can change from a really bad idea, bad language, bad way of living, bad messaging to something different, right? And along with that is we've got to address how fucking complicated we all are. And over the past few years, since 2016, when I've seen very extreme rhetoric, when, for example, when, you know, these celebrities will come out and they'll say something huge and bomb, like just huge and big, Right. Um, whether it's, I'm not even talking about Donald Trump anymore or politics. I'm talking about when somebody gets canceled, somebody said, you know, Kevin Hart, they dug up a tweet about a very homophobic tweet from 10 years ago or whatever. And there's all these things happening in society. And we're so quick to just absolutely annihilate anyone who said something or did something that we don't like or believe something that we don't like. Um, my first thought is, yo, like we all just need to take a step back because no matter who I'm pointing my finger at, you've got skeletons in your closet. You have said things, you have done things, and even more than that, you have thought horrific things, horrific ideas that if the general public ever found out about it, you'd be can't, you couldn't get a job at McDonald's for the rest of your life. Like you're a horrible person. We all have that rolling around in our heads. We've all got that in our hearts. So in light of how fucking complicated we are, how do we get better? And the we is everybody, but me as a leftist, how do we get better at letting people evolve and believing that they can? Yeah, I love that. I think in some ways this book is a call for a political vibe shift. 
um, I think in some ways the vibe of the last many years has been a very strident, angry, um, uh, kind of rageful, despairing vibe. And I don't fault anyone for that. I mean, including myself, who very much participated in that vibe. I think that's the vibe of the Trump years, you know, and what came a little bit before it and what came a little bit has continued a little bit after it, despite Biden winning. I think that was in some ways a very natural vibe to go with this feeling of powerlessness of this really awful thing happening and this really grief of the loss of the country. And, you know, you can't do anything about this big, powerful force so you can, but, but you can, you know, dunk on each other on Twitter and that kind of thing. And so I think in some ways in the despair of not being able to do anything about that, the King, um, we turned on each other and, and our culture turned in this inflammatory direction. To be clear, I think a lot of, some of it, you know, a lot of it even is good. Like, I love that we have an angrier culture around like the abuse of women. And I love that we have an angrier culture on Black Lives Matter. Like, right. I mean, a, a lot of what has arisen as more confrontational in recent years is also just accountability, finally, right? And, and women and people of color telling the world finally what it was always like to be them or trans people telling the world what it was always like to be them. And now we're listening. And that's part of that. That's the generative part of our culture becoming a little more, you know, uh, sometimes tough and demanding. And, you know, and I'm, I'm grateful that people are not suppressing themselves and silencing themselves um, to make things, you know, nice and smooth and happy. That said, I am, I am interested in the problem of how do these people who want the kind of world I want, which is a world of more openness, more inclusion, a world, this kind of America that we're building that is made of people from everywhere, where people of all backgrounds can thrive and live their best lives. Um, How can we win? How can we win? Are we winning? How can we win? You know, I'm not interested in like, can we like have nicer conversations? I'm not like in the braver braver angels, these other things. Like, that's fine. Like, you can do that if you want to do that. I'm not like a moderate, like we should have, as you said, well, and I appreciate you clarifying that about the book. Like, I'm not someone who has like an aesthetic interest in, in the quality of our conversations. Like, I think anger is fine. I think division is actually fine. What I'm really writing about is contempt and dismissal, right? And what marriage counselors will tell you is that anger is fine in a marriage. No problem, right? Fights are fine. Contempt is the end of a marriage, right? And when you get to contempt, it's over or at risk of being over. And I think in America, we've gotten to this place where people who want to win the future have become so contemptuous. We've all become so contemptuous of the others and the possibility that others could change that we're just shooting our own movements in the foot. The people I'm writing about are not Pollyannas. They're not, they're not trying to do dialogue for its own sake. They're quite practically thinking about how do we use the way we communicate with people and use a, have more kind of a, of a strategic empathy um, in order to get more people to defect from fascism so that our kids can have a safe and flourishing life. Friends, thank you so much for showing up and for spending some time with me and us this week and this year. To find links for everything mentioned in today's conversation and to keep up with all things Let's Give a Damn, visit letsgiveadam.com. If you'd like to learn more about and find ways to support our nonprofit at the end of this year, visit letsgiveadam.org. Please share this episode with a friend. Please consider leaving us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and we will see you next year. We have so many more incredible conversations coming your way in 2023. Chad Snavely, Jess Collins Harn and the incredible team at Sound On Studios made this episode. The music is by our friend Propaganda. You can reach out anytime and for any reason at hello at letsgiveadam.com. I love you all. Be safe. Keep giving a damn. Bye for now.